we've identified what it is that we want to build, we need to roughly, and the key word here is roughly, decide what we want it to look like. Uh, one of the worst things you can do is pin yourself down to a very exact API too early on. When you're refactoring towards a new API in an existing system, it's very important that you have good tests. And then the final steps of actually implementing it, we build those objects, we use them internally, we compose them together manually where we need to, and then the DSLs will come from where we find duplication or pain. So before you can design a great API, the first step is to identify the API that you're missing. In any large legacy code base, and, and make no mistake, Rails is just a large legacy code base. All the strategies that you can use everywhere else in your code still apply here. You can find plenty of concepts uh, that are duplicated across the domain. Some of the smells to look for are methods with the same prefix, code that has similar structure, or the big one that you find in Rails a lot are multiple modules or classes that are overriding the same method over and over and over again and call it super. So one of these uh, concepts that we found inside of Active Record was the need for a modifying the type of an attribute. Say, for example, you have a price column on a product table and you would like to represent that as a money object instead of a float. So it might look something like this. We're overriding the reader and writer, checking to see if anything's nil. Do we have to dim the lights a little? Yeah. Also, it's really washed out. Active record. 
And then once we've done that, we're then jumping through even more hoops so that we can maintain the before typecast version of the attribute. Um, so in this case, we're, we're looking for the common concepts and uh, some common smells. So we're overriding the uh, reader and writer. We're duplicating a lot of code. And this is a relatively small behavior change, but it, it, it has to jump through a lot of really complicated hoops in order to do it correctly. It's also important to note that the code when it's written this way introduces a lot of subtle bugs. A lot of other modules may be trying to modify the type of this attribute in very unexpected ways. And the bugs are hard to detect when this behavior is scattered all over the place. Another place that we modify the behavior of, uh, of the typecasting system is with the serialized macro. So this is ultimately, um, we're overriding the method that gets called internally to perform the typecasting instead of overriding the reader and writer explicitly. Uh, unfortunately, this module wasn't this simple uh, when we got started. Here's some more code from the file. And more. And I think you get the picture. Uh, this literally, this module literally overrode every single method in an active record containing the word attribute. And there are five or more, five or more slides uh, uh, with this code that I left out for breath. So, in this case, we are not explicitly overriding a reader and writer, but we are duplicating code from other parts of Active Record. We're jumping through a lot of hoops, and we're overriding literally everything. And this file was the cause of so many bugs in 4.2 and earlier. Um, one of the things I didn't show is that this, ma this macro actually ends up directly modifying the value of the columns hash, which is, which is problematic for reasons that we'll get into a lot later. Uh, another example is enum, where we're, rep we're, we're representing an integer as a known set of strings. Uh, here we're overriding the, uh, the writer method, we're also overriding the reader method, we're also overriding the before typecast, there's, and there's several others. And once again, enum was a, a large source of a significant number of bugs, disproportional to the size of the feature. So we found our missing concept. Typed attributes are overridden everywhere. And one of the things that you might want to uh, might be thinking is, well, if we want to do this so much, maybe other people want to be able to do this. So let's talk about what typecasting is. Typecasting is when you go through and explicitly convert a value from one type to another. Here is a very simple example where we have a value, which is a string, and we want to convert it to an integer. So we call 2i. In Active Record, what we do isn't actually typecasting, it's type coercion, which is the same thing when done implicitly. So here's uh, an example when using Active Record. You have a user model, age is presumably an integer column in the database. We go look at that and decide whenever you assign a value to the age uh, attribute, we're going to convert it to an, an integer. Now the reason that we do this is because Active Record was originally designed to work with web forms you're going to assign params to, uh, to attributes. And having to cast these manually would be a pain. Not just for integer types, but something like date can be significantly harder. We didn't want to have to do, have this code littered all over our controllers, so active record type system was born. The cases we handle today are much more complicated than that, but if you go through the history of how this evolved, everything can be traced back to that original limitation. Uh, now, in Rails 4 and earlier, the only way that you can have a coerced attribute is if it's backed by a database column. We want to be able to hook into this behavior and be able to modify it. So this is what, uh, this is what we, uh, we can get into step two now. We're going to roughly identify what we want it to look like. And this is a, a simpler case. So we're going to have a product model, and we know a, a few things about our API at this point. We're going to need to call some method, in this case we'll go with attribute. We are going to need to uh, say the name of the attribute and have some marker for what the type we want it to be is. Now this uh, is very similar to what you might find in Data Mapper or Mongoloid, which have similar APIs. But we're going to avoid over-specifying the API at this point. And the really nebulous part is going to be how we, how we pass in the type directly. 
is not going to be enough for reasonable implementation. We want something that we want something that's not just a little bit less hacky. We want to have something that we can really be proud of and know that we will be able to maintain in the future. Um, so we're going to start by composing the objects in our system manually. The only one we know of is our type object, but we're going to be looking for places to extract collaborators and compose them to make our lives easier. Before we start introducing the API, we need to say a few brief words about the factory. There's some rules that you need to follow. Rule number one for factoring is have good test coverage. Rule number two is have good test coverage. <laughs> and rule number three is see rules by two. So uh, on the next couple of slides, we're going to, again, there's, the code can be very small. The, the, the specific details of it here aren't important. What is important here is there's a giant case statement. Like many parts of Active Record, it, it's a giant case statement that, uh, just going over a set of symbols. And this is the entire type system in 4.1. We call a bunch of class methods based on a symbol that we had earlier derived from the SQL type. Uh, and you'll see at the top of this, uh, uh, at the top of this there's a, a very small comment there. Casts value, which is a string to the appropriate instance. And I mean, like, you can think of a lot of ways to try and pass in any value that isn't a string. That was one of the most misleading comments I've seen. <laughs> So we know, we're, we know that we're going to introduce a type object, and we know that uh, typecasting currently lives on the column. So first step, let's give the column a type object. So we add a constructor argument, we pass in nil everywhere, and we just run the tests. And that, and that, was, and that was the very first commit that went in going towards this. It's a tiny, tiny step, uh, ex extracting out more and more from what we know, which is that we need a type object and where it's going to live. Um, by injecting it into the into the constructor and find or into the constructor of the columns and finding where the column objects are being constructed, this also is going to point us at the other uh, portions of behavior that we're going to need to modify. Where are we looking up the uh, SQL types for the columns? Where are we constructing these? If we're injecting the type object into this so that we can modify it later, the, these surrounding bits of code are all going to have to change as well. So we're, we go through and in our system and replace all of these case statements. They're all over the place in column, and we just slowly move these methods to a uh, to these type objects. Uh, at this point, we have introduced we introduced a mapping system into our into our connection adapters, which we're not going to look at in detail because it's very boring and tedious. But it replaces the responsibility of uh, looking at the SQL type string and building the symbol integer symbol string symbol timestamp. Um, so, and replace it with a different object based on that. So we have a place that we can start moving all of these case statements to. So we go through our system one by one, and we just each, remove each case statement, and each of these diffs, we're just removing a giant case statement and adding a, uh, another method to our delegate block at the top of the file. So this is, uh, at this point in refactoring, what in a simple type object looks like. This is the string type, which has, which has almost no behavior attached to it. Um, now we've refactored our system into something that's a little bit easier to override. Now we can start looking at actually implementing the API that will let us work into this. So the simplest case we can start with is uh, changing the type of an attribute from string to integer. So let's write a test. This is what the test might look like. We create a model with a schema. It ha uh, we create two attributes with the same type, and we say that we want to change the type of one of them, and then test the coercion behavior. <coughs> um, we've actually written the first invocation of our API, and let's take a, a bit of a closer look at it. So we're starting with the simplest thing that can possibly work. We know we're going to have a type object, so we just pass the type object to our, uh, to our method directly. We could use uh, we could use a constant or a symbol or some other or some other marker for the type, but for now we're going to we're going to keep it very simple and very explicit. This actually turns out to be a design choice that sticks with us through the rest of the refactory, and there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits to giving an, uh, a manual object. You can uh, you can understand what's happening here much more easily. The API becomes much simpler, and I'm not just talking about from an implementation point of view. When you give me an object, you presumably have, a, you have an inkling of what behavior can be modified by this API. 
the object you gave me has, has a known set of methods on it. I presumably cannot possibly change behavior of anything that won't be calling one of those methods. And every DSL that you add has a cost. When you do add a DSL, you want, you want, to, not, you want to try to avoid adding DSLs on top of your DSLs on top of your DSLs. There's a lot of cognitive overhead for what behavior gets modified and where. You, you basically have to memorize every DSL that you introduce into your system. Understanding plain Ruby stops being enough. And the line between being helpful and less painful and being too magic is very, very thin. So we can come up with a very serviceable implementation early on by overriding the column hash, the same thing Serialize does internally. Um, but it, it feels wrong. We're not changing the, the schema of the model, we're changing the structure of the model. However, we're gonna, we want to take the small steps we possibly can, and we want to get to a working implementation of our API as quickly as possible. But if we just try to modify the column hash directly, we're going to run into another problem. So this is how we uh, look up the columns and columns hash inside of Active Record, inside of Active Record base specifically. And when you call either of these methods, they're going to go uh, execute the query immediately. And that means that we can't actually use this inside of any class macros, because it's very important that you be able to load your class into memory, load the definition, and not, uh, and not need a database connection to do that. For example, on uh, Heroku, when you deploy, when your assets are pre-compiled, that loads up the environment, which will load up all of your active record models into memory, but you won't have a database connection. So we need our implementation to be lazy. And when you find that you need laziness in your system, I find that it's very important to separate the lazy form from the strict form and have both of those available. So here's roughly what the code looks like at this point. So on the, on the top here, we have our attribute method, which is the lazy version. Below that, we have define attribute, which is the strict version. And then we're, overri we're overriding, after the schema is loaded, we're going in and overriding all of the columns that we wanted to modify. Now, unfortunately, for most of our cases, um, we're, we're not just modifying the type of an attribute, or we're not just replacing the type of an attribute completely, you want to modify the existing type. Serialized might be backed by text, it might be backed by binary. Um, so what we really need are decorators. Uh, but this again needs to be lazy. We can't go get the current type when you call it because we don't know the current type yet because we haven't gone to the database. Now, decorators are not an API that's going to be public in Rails 5. However, when you, uh, when you are building these lower levels on top of each other, make your internal APIs just as nice to use. You as a maintainer want to, want to be able to understand your system and have the same simple composable uh, APIs available to you that your users do in your public uh, uh, app-facing APIs. So there's a lot of code that I'm leaving out for brevity in, in the implementation of this, but the attribute type uh, decorations is, is going to be an actual object in our system, not, not a hash, even though we're, we're calling merge on it and other hash-like methods. Uh, and it keeps track of the order that they were defined and other complicated things. Um, and one thing, to, one thing to note here in this design, when you're designing a class macro, one of the important things is that it be idempotent. So if you call it at the same time with the same arguments, it should not modify the behavior multiple times. So we're passing in a name of a decorator into this argument instead of just the name of the thing we want to decorate and the block to decorate it with. So that way we can uh, differentiate uh, one decorator from another. So if we're, if we're going to use this for serialize internally, <coughs> If you call serialize twice, you don't want to uh, convert a thing to JSON and then convert that to JSON again. You want to replace the original decoration. So this is what using this API starts to look like as we consume it internally. Uh, we give it a block, we give it a name, and we look for uh, any attribute that we that, uh, previously had defined as a thing that we would convert the time zones on. We then create a new type object that wraps the original and, and in its cast and uh, deserialized methods, it goes in and does the time zone conversion. 
Now we can do the same thing for serialization. However, in this case, we're not basing it off of whether it's a time column. In this case, we're basing it off of purely the name. When you call serialize, it's serialize foo, and you might say JSON instead of YAML. Um, so we can pull this out again. Uh, and this, this seems like a common pattern, wanting to decorate purely based on the name instead of based on additional ar uh, arguments. So we can pull this out into another API internally. So this, this is the, uh, the same thing, but it just takes the name of the attribute instead of uh, the block uh, to compare it things. And this is what serialized looks like in 4.2. The entire file has basically been deleted. Uh, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to put the diff of 4, this file in 4.1 4.2, but it was so huge with all of the red, all of the red things, the, the dots were one pixel tall, and it filled up the entire slot. Um, and this is what the, the type object that we extracted from it looks like. It's, there's code there, right? It's not, it's not zero code, but it's significantly smaller than what was there before. Uh, it turns out most of why uh, internals like that were implemented in the way that they were was just because you have to, you have to know about every possible method that can affect typecasting. So we're, we're, building, we're building our APIs on um, one on another. We built a uh, simple implementation of defining, a, taking a type and an attribute and replacing the original type with the new one. <coughs> on top of that, we were able to build a thing that we could use to decorate an older type. On top of that, we were able to build a, an API to represent a common pattern for that. Once we've, once we've introduced the API into our system, it should be universal. So we're modifying this columns hash internally, which implies that the columns hash has a lot of additional information uh, that is useful to typecasting. And it, at, the, at this point, it really doesn't. We've separated the idea of a type attribute from the database schema. So what we, need, what we have to do in, what we had to do in active record is go through and, make, and introduce internal APIs that may or may not go through the columns hash, that obscure that information away so that eventually we could separate it out and make it so that there was a single canonical way to access the type for an attribute. Now, we're not going to look at all, all of the diffs for this because it took about a year and required rewriting a lot of active record and a lot of error. Um, but this is what the schema definition, the schema inference code, looks like in Rails today, in, on master. Um, so, we're no longer defining all of the behavior of active record based on the column hash. We have a single method where we go load that up and we loop over it, and then we just call public API. So when active record builds the uh, determines the shape of the attributes and what types there from the schema automatically, that's just doing something that we're giving you the ability to do as well. And uh, we also started to we started to find several other objects that we could introduce into our system that made manage management of state in active record much easier. This is one of them, it's called attribute, and it handles the memoization and uh, state transitions between the various states that an attribute can live in. It manages the types. We found that uh, these objects started to be known about everywhere, so we introduced a collection object uh, to, to uh, handle the transitions between those, and this is the thing that you actually, that actually gets mutated. And most methods inside of Active Record now very quickly change to these small one-off things that just delegate to this other object. In a lot of ways, it feels like Active, uh, active Record internally has become an, a really bad implementation of the data wrapper pattern hidden behind a layer of indirection, which I think qualifies it for worst gem, uh, named gem of all time. <laughs> uh, and one of the things in, in our API that we're, that we're looking for is we're trying to remove all of these modules upon modules upon modules that are just overriding behavior over and over again. We found common behavior that needed to be modified uh, frequently. So we pulled out a new object in our system. We, we, when we need to add additional behavior on top of that, we can just use a decorator. We can use object-oriented principles that we all know and love. And when you have an object, again, it has an interface. You can figure out what it can possibly change. So, an API looking simple or having simple invocations is not the same thing as it being easy to understand. Here's the pathological example. If I have a product and that and product belongs to the user, if I change the user's name and I save the product, 
did the user's name change in the database? Raise your hand if you think you know the answer. Trick question, it's based on whether product is a new record. But that's sort of my point, like, belongs to, I wouldn't even think that modify save if I didn't just know it. Like, there's, there's absolutely nothing here that would indicate what could or couldn't change. Certainly, if, if I see that I'm calling the user method and there was a belongs to user, that's fine. But if I want to see what the possibly modify save, where do I look? Do the docs for save say every possible class macro that can modify it? Do I have to go look at the docs for every class macro I've ever invoked on this class to see if that might modify save? And it's also important when, when developing these APIs to have a contract. So these are a couple of things that I think should be universally true for attributes and active record that are not true uh, in 4.1 and are, uh, are true in 4.2 with, the, with these refactoring for this new API. I should also mention this API exists mostly finished internally in 4.2. It's not public, it's not going to be public until 5.0, but most of this work went into 4.2. Um, one of the, but one of the things that we want to have be universally true, when you assign a value to an attribute and then read that value back out, it should never change based on saving and then reloading from the database. If you assign the same value uh, to, a, to a model from what's already there, it should never, it should, the model should never be marked as change. If you just call new on a model and don't give it any attributes, it should never be marked as change. And for any possible value on an attribute, when you pass that to where or find by or any of the finders, you should get that model back. <clears throat> so uh, this is the point where we're supposed to have the big conclusion and the aha and the, and the point. I, I don't really know how to end this talk, so. <laughs> Conclusions, bigger <laughs> <integrated> systems, <laughs> synergy. Please ask me questions now. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Yes? I used the uh, 4.1 API, and I've used the 4.2 API, and you just walked us through a little bit in order to make a JDC adapter driver. <coughs> and I much prefer your 4.2 API. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
And then on uh, the SQLite, the MySQL and Postgres adapters, we introduce a type map object uh, and have a consistent internal structure for how that gets populated, how the lookups occur. Um, but that, that's all internal to the adapter object itself. Um, I think that I, I think that's everything, but I, I honestly would need to have the code open in front of me to, to go into more detail on it. Claudia. Yes. Yes, but uh, I don't want to rewrite all the associations to do that, so no. Oh, I'm sorry, the question was, uh, um, I, I, I felt that uh, passing the type object was a much cleaner API than passing a symbol in, in this DSL. Are there other APIs inside of Rails where I think the same thing is true? Uh, I think associations definitely, because that modifies so much behavior in really unexpected ways, uh, I think we could gain a lot by, by describing that more in terms of objects, especially when you get into the ways gems tend to want to add new behavior to that. Um, but I, that's never going to happen. Uh, so you showed us an example of modifying uh, the attribute of a record that belongs to another record. Mm -hmm. Can you change it to another slide? So are we going to forbid changing the nested model attribute, in this case, in future versions of Rails? No. Uh, the question was, are we going to change this behavior that uh, I think is really confusing? The answer to that is no, we are not, so that is a breaking change. And it's not painful enough to warrant that, uh, going through a deprecation cycle. Any other questions? You showed an example where uh, you can pass a custom money type uh, as a type for an attribute. Uh, if I create a custom type for something and I want to be able to something like that, do I need to create a type object? Is that an API that I have access to? Yes. Uh, and, well, the API you have access to. The question is, uh, if I want to create a money type in my system, is that an API that I have Do I need to do that, and is that an API that I have access to? Um, yes, the API that you have access to is creating a normal Ruby class. Because uh, the, the API in this object is three methods. There is a... Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there, is a, there is a convenience class that you can inherit from if you want to. It's, uh, type, it's called type value, and it gives you things like uh, a template method where if you don't need separate behavior for form input versus database input, which a lot of the simpler types like integer, you're just always converting it to an integer. Uh, it, 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 can, uh, it just calls a single method by default, and then also has a method that you can override where nil is filtered out by default. But uh, you can just, it, it's really easy just to make this inheriting from nothing. Um, and it has three methods, which are cast, serialize, and deserialize, which is form input to the database and then from the database. Uh, the, the contract vault, if you go onto the Edge API, uh, you can find the documentation for the attribute method. And, uh, and also looking at the docs for the type, the, the, value, the class type value, where all of those contracts are pretty poorly documented. So if, if um, 
for example, one of the things that we can deprecate is this behavior that we have where a decimal column with uh, zero precision is treated as an integer for performance reasons in Ruby. We can just deprecate that, auto that, that happening automatically because if you want it to be an integer for performance reasons in Ruby, you can just do that. Uh, I'm personally going to be ex to exhaustively define everything on my models because I hate having to go to schema RB to see what methods I can call on the object. Uh, and I am experimenting. And then I'm experimenting with a workflow where uh, you turn on like this auto magic schema list thing in development when you first are creating the model, and then you can test drive, right? And you like, okay, now I need a title, now I need a body, and you add them to the model, but you never create a migration, uh, and then it just magically saves to one table where it, it can build everything and have most it mostly still work. Uh, and then when you're done, you do Rails G diff migration, and it looks at the model, looks at the schema, diffs them, comes up with the with the migration required to bring them in line with each other. That's probably not going to be done in time for Rails 5, but that is, uh, I, I, I hate the, like, do I modify and rerun this migration, or do I have eight migrations because I don't, or do I just freeze and think of every attribute I'm, I'm ever going to add? Um, so I'm, I'm, trying to find, I'm trying to look at ways that we can use this API to eliminate that. Uh, at, uh, at Heroku, we really like databases, and we really like constraints in databases. <laughs> like, uh, instead of like alleys and this, it's like, hey, why don't we just put a unique like, index? Right. Uh, do you think that potentially in the future your work might open up some areas where we could maybe better support uh, those like, doing what we Yes. Uh, okay, so the question was, at Heroku, they really like databases. Um, I heard Heroku Postgres is pretty cool, and you should check that out. Um, and specifically, if they like database constraints, and is there any chance that this work will lead to uh, better, better support for validating things at the database layer? Uh, hopefully, it, I would love to see us actually treat a unique index on the database as a, um, as a, Act as the canonical way to do that, but still be able to prevent the user-facing error that you get from the uniqueness validation in Rails. Um, for those not familiar, the uniqueness validation in Rails cannot actually validate the uniqueness of anything because it does not have a lock on the database, and uh, the database can change between when it goes to check to see if the value exists and when it tries to save the value. The database is really good at validating this sort of stuff. Um, I love seeing more stuff put over into the database, and yeah, hopefully one day we'll get to the point where that's more the standard way to do it. Woo! <laughs>